Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Autumn is Here. I'm your host, Francine Crawford. And today we have a representative from the Alzheimer's Association, Ms. Wong Ling Hung. She's going to give us some information that will help people who are dealing with Alzheimer's and dementia. Welcome to our show. Hi, Ms. Wong Ling. How are you? Thank you for inviting me and my team. I'm so glad that I finally get a chance to speak to you and especially the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, it is so important uh, to so many people and you've helped so many people. So I'm just very glad that you're able to come and spend some time with us. So can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Um, I actually, my position is very long. I'm di associate director of community engagement and education. And you can see myself is really just um, reaching out to the communities. We want everybody to be aware of this disease. And, and I'm so glad, you know, you reach out to me. We're probably talking to each other for many, many weeks. Finally, we can really see each other and then do this. I'm very excited. Um, myself also, you know, working in the community fields for almost 20 something years, um, mm -hmm. most likely with a nonprofit agency. And this is my heart. Um, our agency's mission is a world without Alzheimer's and all other dementia. And I think this is the best fit to my, you know, um, knowledge. My background um, uh, uh, was a, a nurse and community educators and um, part of the nutrition uh, background as well. So this is a great job. I can never ask for anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, but my agency formed in 1980s and the Alzheimer's Association is a leading volunteer health organizations in Alzheimer's Alzheimer's care, support, and research. And thank you again for inviting me, inviting my team, Alzheimer's Association, New York City chapter. Thank you. Well, I'm so glad to have you. Um, let's talk about Alzheimer's and actually um, what the disease is. Can you tell me a little bit about the disease itself? The Alzheimer's um, and dementia are really two different parts. Um, however, Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. It causes problems with, for example, memory, thinking, and behavior. Um, this is a probably um, most likely people are really unsure about what is Alzheimer's, what is a dementia. Um, it's actually dementia is a symptoms. So symptoms, for example, somebody couldn't uh, remember certain thing or maybe wander on the street. Um, but Alzheimer's is a really uh, specific um, brain nerve cell disease and that really accountable for 60 to 80 percent of the dementia cases. And what is a dementia? Dementia is a general term for symptoms for decline in, for example, I just mentioned memory, reasoning or other thinking skills. Mm -hmm. I hope that explained it um, very clear. Thank you. Like that is important questions. Well, uh, dementia is like the umbrella of uh, the memory loss. Precisely. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, now, how would one know that they they have Alzheimer's? How how does this show up? Can you yeah. tell me something? Let's talk about the symptoms. That's a very important part. Um, when I doing a, lo a lot of education programs into the communities, um, 10 warning signs is actually the, the first education program we want to give it to the community. Um, because how do you recognize the signs? That's the most important part. So, for example, I'm not going to go over 10 signs, but I can mention a few. The yeah. first one is a memory loss that disrupts daily life. Um, it, it could be a little bit different from typical age-related changes because sometimes people may forget things or names, and then that's normal. What is not normal if, for example, somebody is um, going to, let's say, uh, the uh, club for many, many years, and suddenly this person just don't remember, oh, I need to go to this club to meet my friends. That's a memory loss that disrupts daily life. It could be not even uh, able to write the checks or, you know, uh, processing the certain thing. Um, another sign is probably challenging in planning or solving problem. Mm -hmm. 
for the person with a, a encounter in the beginning of the disease, you may not notice a big differences because it happens sometimes and then disappear and then came back again. So that's very common for family members or caregivers I like, notice about the disease in the beginning. The third one maybe is become to have a difficulty to complete the familiar task. For example, somebody used to be an accountant. Um, this person should be very good with math, but somehow unable to add it up the total. And that's a little bit odd because if you're working for as an accountant for many, many years, you're not really forgetting about the simple math added up. Uh, or maybe confused about a time or place, you know, unable to know um, north or south, wander on the street, unable to find a way home, or maybe have a trouble um, to really uh, look at the uh, distance. So it, sometimes a caregiver will tell me like, my mom scratched the cars on the side and then the side window got, got you know, damaged. But then, um, in the beginning, it didn't happen very often. Mm. Gradually, gradually, it just starting to have unable to drive around because the eyes starting to cause the trouble. Like they couldn't really have a good spatial relationship. You know, the closer to other car or they think is very far away, but in fact, it's a very, very close. So this is a probably a, a, another sign, which is a very common. Now, again, I don't want to go over with the 10 different signs, but I have to tell you, Francine, there's no single person has the same signs with another person. Everybody's in a very unique way. Sometimes a person starting to have uh, language problems first, and then another person is perfect until the middle stage or late stage, unable to, you know, find the right word. So this is something I'm so glad you reach out to our team. And then this important and, um, you know, podcast also is important for the education part. So I'm, I'm glad you asked this in very important questions. So how do you, um, if you think that your parent may be going through this or you're going through this, how do you approach it? How do you get tested? What do you ask for? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked this question. This is another a very excellent question. So how do you get tested? Okay, so get test is the most important part. Earlier detection matters. Mm -hmm. um, get get checked, and then you first thing is you need to check with your doctor. You know, if you have a suspicious certain condition, you need to reach out to your doctor or your loved one's uh, care team. That's mm -hmm. the most important part. So if you really reach out to the doctors, um, there are several things that will give you a test. For example, medical history. So that's, again, another thing is if you never visit your doctor for the wellness checkup, that could be a red flag because your doctor couldn't recognize, you know, this blood sugar is, is normal compared from previous years, last year or this year. So I highly recommend everybody should really visit your doctor. Even the wellness checkup is very, very important. They probably will check your physical exam, you know, how you walk, your balance or um, brand image if it's, you know, really needed. Um, they will give you a neurological exam or um, most likely is a um, test about your behaviors, functional and then cognitive mind. Um, other two additional, maybe a blood test or um, there's another one is called CSF test. It's a cerebral spinal fluid, and that could be very painful. So this is a, something you really need to reach out to your primary doctor. If it's really suspicious, primary doctor will refer you to the uh, specialist. So don't wait. Um, really, you have to get a good diagnosis, although some doctors can normally always determine if the person has a dementia, but it may be a little bit difficult to identify the exactly cause. So you need a whole care team to really take care of you. Um, and this is important to take action to figure out what is going on, you know, the situation. Okay. So you gave us some some things to look for, what but there are different stages, correct? Yes. Uh, Alzheimer's dementia. Can you speak about that? 
Sure. Um, basically, Alzheimer's Association, we define three stages. Three stages, the earliest stage, middle stage, and late stage. Um, from the medical care team, they sometimes even define seven stages. So I'm going to focus on three stages. <laughs> Excuse me. Three stages is... Um, Probably is the most um, important part for caregivers to provide the best care according to the different stages. But again, everybody is different. Sometimes people will stay in the earliest stage for a long time and then just progressively very quickly to the middle stage and to the late stage. Mm -hmm. um, earlier stage, they still can function. They can really enjoy whatever the activities there. So again, back to Francis, your questions earlier detection is very, very important. If you test your diagnosis in the early stage, you can really do a lot of things. For example, transfer the financial, you know, if you have to move your money to uh, your uh, care partners, um, that signature is important. Don't wait until the middle stage or late stage. The person may not be able to even write. Um, if somebody is really like, you know, I heard one of the caregivers told me in my my mom, her only wish is going to Hawaii for her, you know, at least once in her lifetime. <clears throat> and then after the diagnosis, they actually took the trip. Mom was really enjoying that. Mm -hmm. If you waited for middle stage or late stage, you, you may not, you know, your mom may not be enjoying for the trip. So this is a something, again, three stages is not like a fine cut like this period of time, you definitely will move on um, to the middle stage and then the middle stage will move to the late stage. Um, everybody is in a different situation. Normally, according to the research, and now again, it's not everybody, right. it's about five to eight years progresses from earlier stage to late stage. But we still have a lot of people call us like after past 10 years, 15 years, they still call our 800 numbers to get help. So again, everybody is different. Okay, so um, what what kind of resources and services does the Alzheimer's Association give? We do have a lot of resources, um, and I'm so glad you asked this one. Um, most important part is my team. <laughs> my team provide a lot of education programs, okay. um, and that's all open to the public, all free because we're uh, part of the nonprofit. We don't charge anything. Whenever you want to learn, we have a, a, a lot of different topics. Um, could be for caregivers. The topic could be for um, a awareness. Um, another topic could be for the caregivers caring some for uh, their loved one from the earlier stage, middle stage, and late stage. We also have a support group. So for the caregivers, you're not alone uh, to take care of your loved one. Joining the uh, support group can really open up your uh, option. Sometimes I heard caregivers say, oh, I didn't even know. I can learn from other caregivers to take care of um, um, their loved one by doing so. You know, so that's another good one. We also have a lot of websites you can really join. And then you probably want to ask me this question later. We do have a clinical trial. Uh, service. We have advocacy, which is a very important for me. I always think you have to be really proactive, talk to the legislators, make sure the legislators will put aside the, you know, important uh, funding or support to anybody who's a caregiver or anybody who's suffering from this disease. Okay, okay. And the walk events too. <laughs> so we have a walk events. Very often um, the family members will support as a walk event because they want to make sure uh, the whole family can support together. That's another activities for the family or even agency, you know, really want to put a very good cost um, to support this event. Oh, Thank okay. You. So that gets everybody together and it gets the, the word yes. out into communities, which is yep. really good. 
Mrs. Williams. We have that once a year, which is a very well known. Um, actually, in New York City, we have um, probably four different events in the different community areas. And that usually happen around um, November, October, late October. So I hope um, I can see more people, you know, coming to support. Most of the money is really contribute back to the researchers. I mentioned about the trial test because we want the researchers to find a cure. Um, perhaps uh, if it's not happening in our, you know, generation, it could be helpful for our next generation or future generations. True, true, true. Are there any um, statistics on people who um, have Alzheimer's and is it increasing or decreasing? Is there anything that you can help us with that? This is a question I would love to answer. <laughs> Francie, this is a data Data can prove a lot of things. Okay? okay. So we actually, Alzheimer's Association, we publish, we call, um, uh, Alzheimer's fact and figures every year. So it's about happening this month. <laughs> the 2023, uh, fact and figures is coming out. And then I hope I can share with you. You're going to be my first person to read the uh, data. Awesome. This is uh, every year we publish this. So talk about the data. I'm going to throw a few things to you here okay more than six million americans are living with alzheimer's mm -hmm. by 2050 this number is going to be you know increased to nearly 13 millions mm -hmm. now again those data could be different because we're going to have a new one this month mm -hmm. um from the last year data one in three seniors dies with Alzheimer's or another dementia. It mm -hmm. kills more than you may not know, breast cancer and prostate cancer combined together. Really? Wow. In 2020, COVID-19 contributed to a, a approximately 17% increase in Alzheimer's and dementia death. Um, in last year, Alzheimer's and other dementias will cost the nation 321 billion. And prediction by 2050, this cost could, you know, reach nearly 1 trillion. And again, the, the data could be, you know, increase more. Uh, I can't wait to see the new data here. More than 11 million Americans provide unpaid care. Can you imagine that? 11 million unpaid care for people with Alzheimer's or other dementias. Mm -hmm. In 2021, these caregivers provide more than 16 million hours um, without paid um, of care value and nearly 272 billion. Uh, Last few thing is very important because I'm also really concerned about our communities because uh, in New York City, we're so diverse. Mm -hmm. So you will be surprised like this data is really truly to tell us what we need to do more. Uh, fewer than one in five Americans are familiar with a mild cognitive impairment. We call MCI, which is a one survey diagnosis um, <clears throat> through your primary doctor's or specialists. Um, that could be, you know, an earlier stage of the Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And 90, can you imagine that? 90% of the doctors say it's very important to diagnose MCI due to Alzheimer's. But over 50, half of the uh, physicians say they are not fully comfortable diagnosing it. So we just mean there's a, a, a diagnosis test tool available, but even the physicians are not comfortable to diagnose this disease. Wow. About one third of people with MCI due to Alzheimer's disease develop dementia within five years of diagnosis. Mm -hmm. The last few things I'm going to tell you is very important because almost two thirds of Americans with Alzheimer's are women females happening more than males older black americans are about twice 50 percent as likely to have alzheimer's or other dementia as older whites mm -hmm. the last one is older hispanics are about one and one half times 1.5 as likely to have Alzheimer's or other dementia as older white. So data never lie. So this is why um, 
when we reach out to the legislator, they want to see data. We will show them the data. This is why we want to do this part podcast. That's why I need to go out to the community to do more. I have to do more to really push this, make sure everybody is understand about this disease, um, because this is truly so important. Um, and I, again, I want to thank you, friend C, to do this, because I know your personal mission is very important. And I'm very touched when I read your invitation. It's just something we need more people like you <laughs> to really work together with Alzheimer's Association, you know, to try to fight this disease and make things happen. And, and we need you. And then uh, thank you again for inviting our team. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Um, is there any other uh, ways to reach out to the community to get people aware? Because you want people aware. So is there, are there any other um, programs and what, what can people do? What can people do? Yeah. So it's um, either both way. I'm going to talk about how we distribute our um, materials to the communities. We're still using the old grandfather ways. You know, we doing this uh, hand uh, materials to the agency, to seniors, mailing. That's another one. We encourage people to sign up our e-newsletters. We do the calls. We reach out to media. Um, we also have a Facebook, Instagram and um, uh, what is the last one? Um, treaters. <laughs> so we have all the materials out there uh, with uh, uh, social media. But we also want people to reach out back to us. So um, I will share more about how to connect with us because you have a question. We have this uh, helpline over 24 hours, seven days. We're here for you. We're here with you. So if you do have any question, please reach out to us. If you don't know what kind of program we offer, we also have a, a link through the web page. Um, and that's something we want to make sure everybody can get the first, um, you know, uh, knowledge about how to provide a better care to your loved one, how to also, you know, um, stay um, healthy and aging well. And I saw your invitation. I love that aging well is the most important part because we want to improve our quality of life. Okay. Thank you. Well, um, a question about um, clinical tests, because um, sometimes people, one, don't, don't know about it. They don't know how to go about it. And some people are afraid of it. So can you explain a little bit more about clinical tests? Yes, we call clinical trial. Okay. Right. So we do have uh, several uh, things here is a free offer. Um, so this is a free, easy to use service, allow anyone to see which studies are good fit for you or your family members. And remember, the study could be reaching out to somebody who has uh, um, Alzheimer's or maybe somebody diagnosed before 50 years old. They're looking for different populations or maybe even somebody who is very healthy. Or maybe you have a family history with uh, Alzheimer's disease. So this is a search for studies. Um, you will receive an email notification about new opportunities or connect with a researcher's team. Um, this is a very easy to use. So we call trial match. You can even go into the link like www.alz org slash and you can just write alzheimer's dementia research or you can just type clinical trial match um this is a free match um but most important part i really want to say is don't just hope for a cure you have to help us to find one and this is everybody's you know be part of this team it's part of like as a volunteer um last month i was really surprised i went to the community and i had an education program and then one lady came over to talk to me. She said, my mom has Alzheimer's already passed away, but I donate my brain through your clinical trials. And then I was like, oh, great. I didn't even know that. <laughs> so every day I'm learning something. I know we have a wonderful clin clinical trial, but I did not know because we have a lot of researchers teams out there. So start with a clinical trial match. And then you can write down this phone number, which is a helpline A0 
once you uh, receive the email, they will ask you either you want uh, them to call you, you can check call, phone call, or you only want to receive the information through the email. They will send you the email and then probably you have to answer a few simple questions. And then the final part is important. They will uh, give you the study matches. You are no obligation to participate. You can read the studies group and then you make that approach to the finalize to yourself. Either you want to join all or you pick one or two. Um, this is the, probably the best way to really um, find the cure for the future. Um, and I'm so glad, Francie, you asked this because um, as we know, even as myself, Asian or African-Americans, uh, communities. It's very hard to get the researches done because most of the people has a bad experience. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to say this. If you ask why all the research data always focus on white people or other population, you know, when come to the data, there's nothing for African American, Latinos, or even Asian is never. So what is the reason? Because nobody joined this kind of researchers team. So there's no data to prove this, you know, related to this population. So again, you really have to think um, if you discourage yourself to join any researchers data, then there's no data will prove um to benefit to your population. So for example, I just mentioned about um African American has a two times much higher to diagnosis with Alzheimer's. It took many, many years to get this data. Um, it's not just like a get it right away um, that year. So um, this is important. And I want to thank Francine, you mentioned about this. And I hope somebody who watched this podcast heard about this important message. Um, we can all join this research because we want to get it done. We want to make sure there's a future, you know, can be benefit to either our generation or future generations. So don't just hope for a cure, really join Join this clinical trial help us to find one. And that could call A002723900. Okay. Okay. Now, that's a good point that we don't have the data. If nobody shows up to do it and do these clinical trials and these matches, then you don't have the data. So yes. That's that's a great point. Well, I'm curious to see if you do you um, partner with other agencies. This is other agencies that um, you'll come together and and help out with this. Yeah, this is a community effort. You know, I can really do it alone. So, for example, um, our team really just um, three years ago, we starting to realize, you know, one one lane, one person cannot just present the programs for um, a hundred. So we really need a volunteer. So we starting to create as a volunteers. Um, um, connect with the communities we um, have right now New York City chapter we have probably about 60 something um, and that's a great achievement because somebody can help us to go out there to the community to do the education programs somebody can really host a support group to really care for our caregivers so this is important Another thing I want to mention, we do have a very rich, rich, I mean, rich and kind community partners in the New York City chapters and including one of you, Francine, because if we are really get this uh, very serious um, project. We need to get it down, but we cannot do it alone. So, for example, I can name a few. There's a volunteer project we combine with the Tsuji's uh, Foundation, which is uh, one of the uh, uh, very well known in Chinese community. I was able to recruit like uh, four community educators to help us do a lot of education program in Chinese. 
We also have uh, other volunteers through the other agencies uh, can present it in Spanish. Um, this is a, probably the best community groups I can ever, you know, think of. Uh, for example, the government agencies also help, you know, step in. Uh, we have done a lot of education program, not only offered through our teams, we also uh, connected with the community groups, for example, libraries, uh, senior centers. School sometimes will invite us, um, and this is a something or healthcare um, agencies. This is a something we, we cannot work alone. We need everybody to really work together, and then make sure we can really educate more people. Make sure there's no caregivers out there, you know, uh, care for the loved one alone and by themselves. Mm, awesome. That's great. I'm great. To he- I'm glad to hear that um, people are working. Great question. <laughs> you need everybody. You need everybody to work together. Yes. So I just want to ask, is there anything that you think about that you want to say that people um, need to know or miss or something that's very, very important um, as we wrap up? Just let me know what you would like to share with the community. Yeah, I want to say find the support. Okay, don't work alone again. Um, and then we're here to help every family, um, and then individual living with Alzheimer's disease. So again, you can really reach out to our helpline. It's all for 24 hours, seven days, never stop, you know, um, to try to help anybody is a zero zero two seven two three nine zero zero. Uh, we will provide information. We will refer you to some other agency. We even have a very high level of the care consultation for free. Uh, very often people were surprised that, oh, you have a care consultation. Yes, we do, because we don't want a caregivers out there uh, without any resources. Or sometimes, uh, like, for example, six months ago, I talked to this gentleman, took care of um, his wife, and he said, I don't need any Anything. I just want to talk to somebody. And I told him, it's okay. We schedule 30 minutes and I just chat. And mm-hmm. after he finished, he said, I feel so much lighter. And I feel almost in tears in my eyes. You know, it is important for somebody just talk to another person. Um, actually that conversation and care consultation meeting leading to he joined one of the, our uh, support group. So this is all good uh, benefit back to the communities. Um, you can join our online communities and learning through. Um, we also have a free online tool, which is called uh, Alzheimer's Navigators. Um, it's for somebody who needs a step-by-step guidance. And this is all free through our webpage, um, alz.org. You can also reach out to our local chapters. I am just covering New York City chapter uh, for five hours. But I know, and Francie, you know that too, in New York City, there's no care- caregivers carrying their loved one also in New York City. We heard a lot of people like, you know, either children in California and the parents living in Queens or maybe um person living in Manhattan, but actually carrying somebody even overseas or maybe in another state. So this is something if you need to reach out to other chapters, just call out 800 numbers 272-3900. Someone will always refer you to have, you know, another chapter to help you and then provide the same support New York City chapter is providing. Awesome. I think I answered your question, but I think deeper um um thought about my own experience, um, denial is very uh, common. Um, Mm -hmm. Either the person living with Alzheimer's denial or the caregiver sometimes with denial. Um, Even myself working for Alzheimer's Association for five years, um, my my father um, who uh, was a doctor practiced for more than like a 60 years old. And when he um, had a um, health situation in the later um stage 
and I was denied. I went to the doctor and say, "No, my doctor, doctor, my my father is doctor. He can never have a dementia." So、mm-hmm. this is something <laughs> we all want to know because I read your bio, Francine. In the beginning, you are also in the midst of this jungle. We all need to clear this mess. Make sure the caregivers can, you know,、uh, learn quickly instead of like you and I, you know, have to went through a, a, a few emotions. Emotional struggles.、Um, this is my goal through this podcast. I hope somebody can just get this information and, and then get your answer right away. Talk to your doctor. Be proactive. Don't just go to the doctor's office and then left without answering your question. And very often, a few、uh, caregivers will come to me and then talk about, "Oh, I have this question." I say, "Wait a minute! I thought you just took your, you know, mother to the doctor last week,、mm-hmm. and this is a really simple doctor can answer." And guess what? Our caregiver is just so humble. She say, "No, doctor is so busy. I don't want to bother. No, you need to bother your mom's doctor." Yes. That's the key. You need to get an answer. If doctor couldn't give you the answer, you need to make another appointment. Make sure, make sure you get an answer. Be proactive. And、mm-hmm. the last one I would like to suggestion is. Try to make sure you know what are you talking about when you talk to your doctor. When you talk to the legislator, you need to know mom's situation. For example, six months ago, scratched the car. You know, four months ago, lost、um, in the neighborhood. Doctor needs this information, so create a notebook. Write down everything. Be prepared. Talk to your healthcare provider, even social workers, nurse. Those are the people are front line to help you. And by doing so, you give them more information. They can help you more. Okay, so that's my takeaway.、Uh, don't don't ever shine to your、um, healthcare providers. You need to be proactive. Wow, that, that that that's amazing. That was a good takeaway.、Um, you talked about denial, and you talked about the caregivers and support. So、um, that was very good because sometimes we don't even realize. You know, you love your your parents so much. You're like, no, they, you know, it's just it's just something. It'll pass. You know, and you have to be aware. You're the person that has to watch them and be aware and bring it to the doctor's attention and speak up. We want people、Definitely. to speak up, ask questions. It's okay to ask a doctor a question, especially if you don't understand. You know, sometimes they'll say something and you don't understand, and you can just stop them and say, "Listen, I I don't understand exactly what that means. You know, what does that look like? You know, people say words, but you don't know what that look like. What am I supposed to expect? You know, so so thank you so much. Thank you so much for for coming on for、um, just taking some time and getting so much great information about the Alzheimer's Association. I appreciate the work that they're doing.、Um, I have、uh, my my goal is that I I know that they're going to be is going to be a cure. I don't know if it'll be in my lifetime, but I know they're working towards it and they're, they're doing things that are going to help it or you know diminish it or be able to. People to be able to live with it, maybe if it's not a cure, you know, maybe it's something that well, that will happen. So、um, I am very hopeful for that, and I'm grateful for the Alzheimer's Association that they're working hard to that and getting the community involved is so very, very important, you know, and getting the word out. So thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it, and I'm just so glad that you were able to and kind enough to be able to. Spend some time with us and work with us. Autumn is here and give out all your information that you have, and I'm sure it'll help somebody. I am sure it'll help somebody. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me, inviting my team, and then thank you for all the people listening to this podcast.、Um, truly, this is just we need Francine, this kind of person. We need you. We need the leaders like you. <laughs> we need the Alzheimer's as the resources. We can fight for this disease. Definitely. Thank、Ab- you. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well. Good night. Good night. <laughs>